Americans wish they had something as powerful as the tax-free savings account. In today's video, I'm gonna lay out what a TFSA really is, why Canadians mostly misuse them, how it compares to an RRSP, and everything you need to know about these accounts to make you filthy rich. Before we get into it, I'd love if you guys hit the like button because it really helps the channel. Starting in 2009, the Canadian government introduced a TFSA as a way to encourage people to save more. For many young adults, this is the first account you should probably use when you get started with investing. It's similar to a checking or savings account where you can put money into it, but unlike a savings account, you could also put stocks, ETFs, and other assets within it. The gains that you make from investments within the TFSA are completely tax free, i.e. all yours. Say you used your TFSA to buy Tesla stock right after an IPO. You'd have millions and millions and millions of dollars and it would be completely tax-free. There is no limits to the gains that you could make within the account. It's just tax-free, babe. You can make contributions, dictate which investments go within it, and withdraw the money at any time, penalty-free. However, there is one thing that dividend investors in particular should be aware of with respect to the TFSA. Because the United States does not recognize the TFSA as a retirement account, there's a 15% withholding tax on dividends paid out to stocks within a TFSA. You don't have to really do anything. They just pay you out the 85% as opposed to 100%, and that's pretty much it. But if you're wondering why it came and a bit short, there's a 15% withholding tax. Now to open a TFSA, you need to be the age of majority in your province, which is 18 for most, but in places like BC, it's 19. It's a great incentive for investing early and often, but you may be wondering why is it called a tax-free savings account if it's best for investing? See, the thing is the savings account portion of the name is extremely misleading. TFSAs are most powerful when you utilize it for investing as opposed to saving. And the savings portion of the name really confuses a lot of Canadians into not utilizing how it should be. People just plot money into a TFSA and think that they've invested when really they haven't done anything. They've just put in the money similar to a savings account. The growth doesn't actually come from the TFSA. TFSA. It's the assets that are within the TFSA and the TFSA is sort of like a basket or a shield that protects these assets from taxes, but it isn't the investment itself. My favorite assets are exchange traded funds, but you could also do stocks, bonds, REITs, and a ton of different ones. Okay, great. So let's just put all the money we can in a TFSA with no limit and we'll never pay taxes again. Well, that's not how it works. Though there are few, TFSAs do have contribution rules associated with them. You're free to withdraw the money at any time, but there are limits to how much you can contribute per year or in general. The maximum you're allowed to contribute to your TFSA is called the contribution limit, and this varies from year to year in terms of how much is added to it. TFSA contribution room accumulates every single year if at any time you are 18 in the calendar year and every year after that. You also must be a resident of Canada. If you meet these requirements, you can have as many TFSA accounts as you want so long as the sum total of contributions is still within your contribution limit. When TFSAs were first launched, they started out with a $5,000 contribution limit. And it stayed at 5,500 all the way up until 2018, except for 2015, which I can't even remember why they did this, but it was like 10,000. They just they just made it 10,000 in a year and then reverted back to 5,500. In 2019, they increased it to 6,000 and it stayed that way for 20, 21, and 22. And next year they're projecting it should be 6,500. What this means is that every single year since you've turned 18, you've been accumulating TFSA room, whether you knew it or not. Now, this all might be a little bit confusing, but don't worry, there's actually TFSA calculators online that you can look up to figure out how much contribution room you have. And you can also check out your CRA My account and it'll give you a more accurate number. If you're like a 20 something, you're getting started with TFSA, you've got tens of thousands of dollars worth of room. For reference, I'm a 97, I'm 25 years old. I have $50,500 worth of max room. But if you're 18, 19, it is that 6,000. It's likely going to increase to that 6,500 next year. Generally, you have a good amount of room to get started with investing. Now, your investment gains do not impact your contribution. It's purely based on the outside cash that you're contributing. Now, you're typically never going to lose contribution room but there is a little bit of a caveat. If you do withdraw from your TFSA, you temporarily lose that room until next year. Here's an example. Let's say you made a $6,000 contribution to your TFSA. Later that year, you withdraw 3,000 from your TFSA, which I don't think is a great idea because it should be for long-term investing, but that's besides the point. So you withdraw $3,000 and you end up finding out that you can't go on the trip. So now you just have three grand outside of your TFSA. Now, if you wanted to just put that $3,000 back and you only had $6,000 worth of contribution room, let's say you're 18 years old, 19 years old, you actually actually can't until next year. But the thing is, it'll get added to next year's contribution increase, right? So if, let's say it's another 6,000 next year, you'll get the 6,000 plus the 3,000, so you have $9,000 added to your contribution limit. So you don't lose the room, you just temporarily can't for the remaining calendar year. However, if you took that same $6,000, invested it, into something really, really, like really risky, lost half the value and withdrew the 3000, 
Well, next year, you'll only be able to recontribute that 3,000 plus the new contribution room. Meaning that if you lost that much money in your TFSA from an investment, you've just lost that room forever. This is because it's the new contribution room plus withdrawals that is added next year, not what you originally put in. This is why I think TFSAs should solely be used for long-term investing and not gambling into YOLO stock. Another thing you should be aware of is over-contributing. Any contribution over the maximum allowable amount is considered an over-contribution. The CRA, AKA the tax boogie band, will charge you a 1% fee on the excess amount per month until you take that shit out. So it's very important, especially in your early years of your TFSA, that you're keeping an eye on your contributions. Now, heads up to a lot of you, you guys might have a ton of room if you're way older than 18 or a little bit older than 18. Uh, so these things might not be as you know pertinent to you, but it's still important that you guys know these things. Now, the reason I said the US wishes they had this account is because their comparable account to a TFSA is a Roth IRA. And the thing is with them, you can't with basically withdraw it without penalty. They're basically locked in for decades and decades and decades. And while I think TFSAs are best used for long-term investments and you shouldn't be withdrawing and taking out the money anyway, they literally can't do that. And so if they had what we had, I mean, there'd be Congress meetings about it. There'd be outrage the rich versus the poor, all this different stuff because people would just be going to town on them. So we are very lucky here in Canada and it is a world-class registered account. Okay, so so far you're probably thinking a TFSA is a place for me to buy stocks and bonds and investments. You're thinking I probably already accumulated quite a bit of room without even knowing it. Probably the first account I should use if I wanna get started with investing. And overall, it's a great wealth builder. Well, yes, 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 that is it. Ideally, you want to be maxing out both your TFSA and your RRSP, but a TFSA is quite a bit simpler, so it's the best place to kind of get your feet wet, but quickly let's compare the TFSA and the RSP. So a registered retirement savings plan or RSP, which is again a bad name, it should be a registered retirement investing plan, is usually used for long, long-term savings, where a TFSA, technically speaking, can be used to save for anything. They're different in two main ways. Number one is contributions made to your RSP are tax deductible, aka you get a tax write-off for your contributions to it. You do not get this with the TFSA. And number two, withdrawals from your RSP are taxed as income, whereas withdrawals from your TFSA are completely tax-free. So what the hell does that all mean? Well, the fundamental difference between these two accounts is when you want to take the tax hit. The money that you're contributing to your TFSA has already been taxed, aka this is money from your job and your employer's already deducted taxes. These are called post-tax dollars. So these dollars that have already been taxed are put into the TFSA. And when you get the tax break is later in the future when you withdraw. With an RRSP, however, we just talked about how you get a tax break for your contribution. So you get an immediate tax benefit. This makes the dollars that are contributed to an RRSP RSP pre-tax. Now, you're not paying any taxes on your contributions to your RSP. You're not paying any taxes on buying and selling that's happening within the RSP. You pay taxes when you withdraw from it. So hypothetically, let's say you're using both accounts for long-term use. Generally, the account that you should be leaning towards more is the one that gives you the most tax upside. The general rule is that if you believe you're gonna be earning way more in the future, or you believe that tax rates generally are going to be a lot higher in the future, then the TFSA is a better bang for your buck. However, if you believe the tax benefits of an RSP would serve you extremely well now because you're making a ton of money or you expect tax rates to be lower down the line or you're just gonna be making less money down the line then you want to lean more to an RSP. Now, my opinion on the matter is that the whole argument's kind of silly. I think generally Canadian investors should just start out with the TFSA because it's the most simple, get your feet wet and then start to use an RSP and then your goal should be to max out both of them. Now, caveat here is that if your work offers an RRSP plan and it offers a match, that's free money, you take that every time no matter what TFSA RSP order, you just, you take that because it's free money. The reason I think it's silly is that if you're investing in both of these accounts, you've already won. Like you're already so far ahead of so many people that the order isn't as significant, but it is worth considering once you're like more advanced with your investing. But if you're just getting started, a TFSA is very simple just to kind of get used to everything. And then you can transition to the RSP, RESPs, and then like all the different registered accounts. Now, how do you become a millionaire with these things? You've probably been killing yourself wondering like, where's this millionaire portion come in? And here it is. Let's say you're 22 years old. You just graduated, got your first big boy or big girl job, and you want to start building some wealth. Let's say you invest until you're 65. And for this example, let's just assume that the TFSA contribution room stays at 6,000 for 40 years, which obviously it will not. It will get a lot more than that. It'll get adjusted upward for inflation. But just for this example, let's just say it stays at 6,000 and you're able to max it out each and every year. This equates to $500 a month invested. Let's say you invest in a US broad-based market ETF. Let's say you get 8%, which is actually a little bit lower than the historical average. 500 bucks every month in the US market till you're 65 would net you $2 million if you had that 8% return, tax free. Now let's say you invest in the US market, but it does the 9.8% historical average return. 500 a month in the market would net you 3.6 
million dollars. Now for fun, let's just be optimistic and say the market does better than it does historically. Let's say it does 12%. By the time you turn 65, if you did 500 bucks a month, every month, you would have $7 million dollars completely tax-free now again you're gonna be able to put even more into your TFSA you're gonna be earning more throughout your career because you're ambitious and you're a winner and you're a go-getter and you're gonna be able to sock away more money and what about your RSPs and your other accounts your non-registered accounts and you can make so much money if you start young it's insane now I know a lot of trolls are probably thinking well what about inflation and you're basically not gonna have any money yes inflation is bad right now but historically inflation is anywhere from two to three percent so what you can do is incorporate that into your returns but again even with our scenario and you incorporate that inflation adjusted return, you're still getting millions of dollars with the purchasing power if the market returns anything close to what it has historically. TFSAs provide a fantastic opportunity for whatever the hell you want. But for the third or fourth time in this video, they're best for long-term investing. Account balances grow tax-free. Withdrawals are tax-free. And again, you can take withdrawals out whenever the hell you want, as long as you're mindful of your recontribution limits. If you want to open a TFSA and one of the best brokers in Canada, I definitely think you should check out my Well Simple Trade review above. But if you enjoyed this video, I'd really love if you click the subscribe. There's going to be way more like it. And we'll see you in the next one.